Washington, D.C.'s police department is creating the nation's largest network of surveillance cameras. The system would include more than 200 cameras throughout the city. Today, a House Government Reform Subcommittee looked into security and privacy concerns. Maryland Congresswoman Connie Morella chairs the two-and-a-half-hour hearing. Good morning. I'm going to call the uh, Subcommittee of the District of Columbia uh, hearing to order. Our, our issue today is privacy versus security, electronic surveillance in the nation's capital, and I want to welcome everybody who is here. I'm going to ask that my opening comments uh, in its entirety be included in the record because I'm going to give an abbreviated version. Thank you. Without objection. We live in a video age. Police forces, including the Metropolitan Police Department, are increasingly employing video surveillance, both to deter crime and to catch criminals. The Metropolitan Police Department is in the process of establishing the most extensive surveillance network in the United States, a system that could ultimately include more than 1,000 cameras, all linked to a central command station accessible to not only the district police, but the FBI, the Capitol Police, the Secret Service, and other law enforcement agencies. The existence of such a network raises many questions. Among them, does the prevalence of cameras inhibit our privacy rights? Are these cameras effective in deterring or solving crimes? And perhaps most urgently, who gave permission for the implementation of this system, and where are the policies governing uh, its use? I believe there's been an unfortunate lack of public debate on these issues. Even supporters of electronic surveillance concede that police departments should only use these cameras if there's a widespread public desire for such technology. There's clearly no consensus in the District of Columbia for or against these cameras because the public only learned about their existence after they'd been put in place. Citizens must have confidence that electronic surveillance is not going to infringe on their rights, including what Justice Louis uh, Brandeis described as our most precious right, the right to be left alone. We saw the dangers of moving too quickly with this technology when the district had its problems with faulty red light cameras and the due process issues now being raised regarding the speeding cameras. I understand the Metropolitan Police Department now has 13 closed-circuit cameras of its own linked to its Joint Operations Command Center, and it is working on linking this center to several hundred existing cameras in public schools and subway stations. There are also plans to connect this center with hundreds of regional traffic cameras. One of the biggest concerns that I have is that once this system is in place, it'll be too tempting for the police not to use it to its full force. It's the old camel's nose story, or maybe we should say the camera's nose. Once the camel gets his nose under the tent, pretty soon the rest of the camera will be under the tent. And once the police have cameras that can see anywhere in the city, pretty soon the police will be using those cameras to look anywhere in the city. In London, a camera system initiated to combat IRA terrorism has sprouted into a network with an estimated two and a half million cameras. The average Londoner is caught on film about 300 times a day, and no terrorists have been caught by the camera's use. Does the nation's capital want to build such a system? I have heard Chief Ramsey say no, that this is a system designed to be event-specific, to be activated only during threats of terror or large public events. But Mayor Williams has said publicly that the city should follow the lead of cities such as London, which use the cameras to enhance day-to-day -day policing. The chief has also said the department will consider installing cameras in neighborhoods that have problems with drug markets uh, and the like. Obviously, some guidance, maybe legislation from the mayor and the council of the District of Columbia, is needed to establish how extensive this camera network should be and what safeguards are necessary to protect privacy rights. 
The policymakers must give clear direction to the police. Congress, too, may have to step in and ensure that this technology uh, does, take, uh, does not take away our right to be left alone, as it has in the past when privacy concerns have become an issue. This is especially true given the testimony from the U.S. Park Service, which is planning to place cameras at the monuments on our National Mall. We have two panels today, one that will primarily focus on the district's own surveillance system and one that will be able to broaden the discussion a little further into the constitutional and legislative questions. We did invite several others to testify, including the Capitol Police and Justice Department, but they declined, saying they had no role to play in a discussion of the district surveillance network. And the British government doesn't let government officials testify before Congress, so we were unable to get someone who could speak with first-hand knowledge about London's experience. In concluding my remarks, I, I want to say that our nation's capital stands as an ultimate symbol to American freedom. Since taking the chairmanship of this subcommittee 15 months ago, I have worked with Congresswoman Norton on many issues, but perhaps no single one as frequently as trying to keep this city safe, open, and accessible to the residents, businesses, and 19 million tourists who come here each year. I've said before that we cannot turn the district into Fort Washington. It matters not whether that for fortress is built with an impenetrable ring of concrete barriers or with an unregulated network of digital cameras. It is now my pleasure to recognize the ranking member, uh, Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, for her opening statement. Thank you, Ms. Morella. I appreciate the leadership of our chair. Connie Morella, in focusing our subcommittee on important issues of privacy raised by security threats and technology that have become a special concern since the September 11th attacks. The surveillance cameras at issue were initiated before September the 11th, however. Initially, they were not used because of terrorist threats to security, but for law, enfor law enforcement purposes at national events where lawlessness from demonstrators and others sometimes occurs. Thus, it seems clear that as technology becomes available, government, like the rest of us, gravitates toward its use. However, government is not like the rest of us. Government is not like citizens with a new toy. There are deeply felt cultural norms and critical constitutional limits on how public officials may carry out their work, even responsibilities as important as public safety. For Americans, where cameras that view residents should be placed is not merely a security issue. Personal privacy and the right to be left alone, especially from interference by government, is an identifying characteristic of what it means to be an American. Nevertheless, much of what we focus on today is unchartered territory. Our subcommittee is one of the first in Congress to investigate surveillance cameras that are used for security purposes, perhaps the very first. Such cameras in the district present a particularly difficult case for arriving at the appropriate balance in a society like ours. As the nation's capital, the district is, presumed, is a presumed terrorist target. And as the use of the surveillance cameras here, even before September 11th shows, the city also is the foremost site for many national and international events that have the potential to generate harm to residents and visitors and damage to property. The cameras are now collected to the district's Joint Operations Command Center. And I want to especially commend Council Member Kathy Patterson, Chair of the City Council's Committee on the Judiciary, for promptly calling witnesses and for planning further hearings concerning the surveillance cameras. The city's first hearing has uncovered important information and already is leading to remedial action. This subcommittee has larger federal concerns that affect not only the district, but, uh, but the nation. Even the district's use of surveillance camera, cameras was motivated not by district mat matters, but by security needs at national and international events. 
and already the district system is trending toward other federal uses that may rapidly become significantly greater than local involvement. Initially, at least five of 13 locations are related to federal sites. Already, three more federal agencies may be seeking connections. There's no way to avoid the conclusion that in the new era of global terrorism, the district's camera surveillance system is inevitably already part and parcel of the nation's homeland defense. As such, the surveillance is likely to be imitated in other locations, especially in the many jurisdictions where there is a federal presence. The need to assure greater security in the nation's capital and elsewhere, especially following September 11th, is beyond debate. Today, however, we will want to know more about the uses to which the system is being and could be put, how and when the system is used, its limits, its known benefits and dangers, and what the surveillance has accomplished so far. As perhaps the first such surveillance system in the country, there is a heavy burden on the users to set the appropriate example and to do it right. However, public officials here are caught in a dilemma not of their own making. Like other officials throughout the country, they are being asked to respond to the unknown with no precedence to guide them. I believe that it is both unfair and dangerous for the national government to ask local and state officials to figure out the plethora of complicated issues involving security, privacy, and openness no society in the history of the world has had to face without any federal guidance. However, the federal government itself faces the same complicated challenge to protect the people while maintaining their constitutionally guaranteed rights. The example that the federal government is offering leaves much to be desired. Federal officials are quickly throwing up new approaches and systems, from shutdowns, barricades, and public exclusion, to camera surveillance, wholesale roundups, and electronic surveillance without regard to the Fourth Amendment or other constitutional protections, and without notice in public hearings or even any public explanation. Civil libertarians are right to question much about this response and public officials are right to revitalize their responsibility to protect the public with new and increased seriousness. However, both the general public and public officials need more explicit guidance from the federal government. Yet Homeland Security Director Tom Ridge has all he can do simply to catch up to an increasing set of new demands created by September the 11th, most of them just beginning to take on the basics such as calibrated alerts and the security safeguards that are necessary to fully reopen National Airport. Because both the local and federal governments face the same dilemma, it is particularly unjustifiable that nearly all the federal officials invited to testify today have declined. They are the Office of Homeland Security, the Department of Justice, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Capitol Police, and the United States Secret Service. Particularly since most of the new security needs or requirements are federal in origin, the least that Cong Congress is entitled to is the kind of testimony that can be presented without injury to national security. When even that testimony is withheld, complaints from administration agencies concerning any legislation that results will be unavailing. I believe that a more cooperative and forthright approach that faces these dilemmas head on, together trying to find solutions, is what is needed. To help sort out the conundrum of at once opening the society and closing down terrorism, I will shortly be introducing the Open Society with Security Act along with a Senate sponsor. The bill would authorize a presidential commission to bring together the best minds in the society to investigate how our country can meet the high standards necessary to effectively fight the dangerous menace of international terrorism while accommodating and affirming the central American values of privacy, openness, and public access. 
like the Kerner Commission, the Open Society with Security Commission would help us to chart a safe course through deep waters without surrendering the very values that lead us to insist upon defending our country and our way of life. We can do better than blunt and often untested and ineffective instruments that crush our liberty. I spent my early years at the bar as assistant legal director for the national ACLU, and today I have responsibilities for national security as a member of Congress. My experience in both roles has reinforced my confidence that American ingenuity is ready for the new challenge of winning the struggle against dangerous and dogmatic terrorism while maintaining and enriching the free and open democratic society that virtually defines our country. I welcome today's witnesses and appreciate their testimony. I'm certain that when, when we have heard them, all of us will be in a better position to find the appropriate solutions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Right. Thank you, uh, Congresswoman Norton. I'm going to ask our first panel to come forward, please. And uh, before they even uh, uh, are seated, if you would continue to stand so I can um, administer the oath that is the tradition before this uh, full committee and subcommittee. If you'd raise your right hand, do you swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. The record will uh, reflect affirmative response. We have for our first panel Kathleen Patterson, Chairwoman of the Committee on the Judiciary, the Council of the District of Columbia. Welcome, Ms. Patterson. Uh, we also have our Police Chief, Charles Ramsey, Chief of the Metropolitan Police Department of the District of Columbia, Chief Ramsey. And we have John Parsons, Associate Regional Director, National Capital Region of the National Park Service. Margaret uh, Nettlekoff Kellams, uh, the Deputy Mayor for Public Safety and Justice of the District of Columbia is on her way, and when she arrives, we will swear her in and, and listen to her testimony. You're all veterans of uh, this subcommittee and, and uh, other subcommittees and committees, and so I would request that, again, you um, keep your comments uh, to about five minutes, and the entire testimony that you submit will be included in the record, and that'll give us a chance to ask this first panel questions. So if we start off with you, um, uh, Chairwoman Patterson. Thank you very much, and good morning. Thank you. Uh, I, as you noted, I'm Councilmember Kathy Patterson. I represent Ward 3, and I serve as chair of the Council Committee on the Judiciary, which has oversight responsibility for the Metropolitan Police Department and criminal justice issues generally. Deputy Mayor Kellams and Chief Ramsey will, I'm sure, give you an overview of what is in place today in the district in terms of video surveillance employed by the Metropolitan Police Department's Synchronized Operations Command Center, and I'm here to share the perspective of the legislature. First, surveillance, including photo surveillance, is a long-standing and legitimate tool for law enforcement in the District of Columbia, as it is elsewhere. The DC Code, for example, includes a definition of the term law enforcement vehicle that includes surveillance as a law enforcement activity. The more recent Drug-Related Nuisance Abatement Act of 1999 permits the court to issue an order to abate a nuisance that would include, quote, use of videotape surveillance of the property in adjacent alleys, sidewalks, or parking lots. And our courts have long held had the authority to issue warrants for electronic surveillance in connection with crimes and offenses committed within the District of Columbia. What is at issue today, as you both have noted, is whether technology itself has blurred or even moved the line between what is longstanding and legitimate law enforcement use of surveillance and what is an unwarranted and potentially illegal violation of privacy rights. Surveillance cameras mounted on district buildings now can monitor the movements of individuals up to and including creating images that can be scanned into a computer and used much as fingerprints are used today. It is fair to say there are two distinct and divergent reactions to this use of technology, those who fear a loss of privacy and those who see ready advantage in the use of cutting-edge technology as a crime-fighting tool. Many districts res <coughs> district residents <coughs> have expressed concern about the potential intrusion into their lives in space. 
Guy Gwynn, on behalf of the Federation of Citizens Associations of the District of Columbia, testified before the Council Committee on the Judiciary in February. As follows, we have federal and state laws against wiretapping with heavy penalties. Obviously, we cannot omit having the same sort of citizen protection extended to the new technology and its largely undefined legal status. The Federation recommended legislation to define the legal use of surveillance, including protecting privacy and security of file tapes and civil and criminal pen penalties for anyone who abuses a surveillance system. Another witness before the Judiciary Committee in February was Mara Verhayden Hilliard, who defends um, a group of demonstrators who have demonstrated in the District of Columbia and to, on international economic policy and notes that the police department has been surveilling such demonstrations for quite some time, including demonstrations in 2000 and 2001. At the same council hearing, the ACLU provided research information that I'm sure their testimony will provide to this committee today in terms of experiences elsewhere. I've summarized the viewpoint of district residents who are concerned about surveillance cameras. Others support the concept wholeheartedly and want to know what they can do to bring cameras into their own neighborhoods. They want surveillance technology as a potential deterrent to neighborhood crime. I would note that six years ago, the parents at the junior high school my children attended raised their own money to install closed circuit television as a security member measure. Since that time, DC public schools have installed video monitoring systems in 20 elementary schools, 56 junior and senior high schools with broad support from parents and residents. The school system is moving forward to have such systems in place in all of the city's schools, paid for in part with federal emergency preparedness funds. The Council of the District of Columbia adopted emergency legislation earlier this month to require that guidelines drafted by the police department come to us for review. This is clearly an issue calling for extensive and wide-reaching public discussion, and I anticipate further public hearings on the issue. The Council as a body has not taken a position on the use of surveillance, and I suspect we will, as a group, be of the same two minds I'm reflecting in this testimony. Concern with privacy rights and concern with use of technology to the maximum extent possible to promote public safety. Having seen what is available at the Police Department's Operations Center, it is easy to understand the potential use of such surveillance. Its use, for example, in a citywide evacuation, its use in responding to a major fire or any other large-scale emergency. The use in protest is another matter. The potential use of image scanning is yet a more difficult issue. I would like to underscore that it is my responsibility and that of my colleagues and Mayor Williams to find the appropriate balance between privacy and public safety and to establish that balance in public policy. I would also respectfully suggest that this committee and this Congress also needs to take up the issue, and I'm delighted to hear Congresswoman Norton mention legislation to provide a, a national debate on this issue. We all have our work cut out for us in discussing and debating how and whether we use advances in technology, for what purpose and with what result. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Chairwoman Patterson. Uh, and you've been very concise, and I note that you have extrapolated from your uh, submitted written testimony. Uh, pleasure to have you with us, as always. Uh, Chief Ramsey, thank you, sir. Good morning. Madam Chair, Congresswoman Norton, members of subcommittee staff and guests, in recent weeks, an awful lot has been written about the Metropolitan Police Department's use of closed circuit TV or CCTV. Much of the reporting has been factual. Regrettably, some of it has been less than accurate. I applaud the subcommittee for calling today's hearing, and I thank you for the opportunity to inject not only the, the facts, but also some perspective into this discussion. Let me state up front that the Metropolitan Police Department welcomes public scrutiny of our policies and programs. Our Joint Operations Command Center remains an open book, accessible to news reporters, law enforcement officials, and political leaders from across the country and around the world. When the ACLU and others expressed concern about our use of CCTV, we invited those groups in for a demonstration and meeting. The bottom line, we welcome public debate, but we ask that the debate be based on facts, not on conjecture. Fact number one, the Metropolitan Police Department is using CCTV in public spaces only in a limited, legal, and responsible manner. We're not running a 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week video monitoring operation. The Joint Operations Command Center is activated only during major events in our city, large demonstrations, presidential inaugurations, and the like, or during periods of heightened alert for terrorism, such as the weeks immediately following September 11th and during the Olympic Games in Salt Lake City. During other times, including right now, the center is not operational. Our use of CCTV is need-driven. 
when there are specific threats and tangible public safety benefits from activating it. Another misconception is that our department has a vast network of hundreds of cameras at our disposal at any moment. No, we do not. Our current system includes approximately a dozen cameras mounted on buildings in downtown D.C. and focused on high-risk targets for terrorism, including the National Mall and public spaces outside Union Station, the White House, and the Capitol. During times of heightened alert, the cameras give us a clear, real-time view of those potential targets without having to dedicate police officers on the ground to this type of monitoring activity. Our use of CCTV is legal. The cameras monitor only public spaces. There is no audio overhear capability in our system. As such, we are not engaging in electronic surveillance as defined in law. And finally, the use of CCTV is sensitive to the privacy expectations of individuals. When our cameras are operational, they generally focus on broad public spaces, not on individuals within those areas, and we do not employ any type of face recognition technology. Fact number two, the Metropolitan Police Department is working to link our Joint Operations Command Center with other public agency closed-circuit television systems that monitor public spaces, but we have no interest in linking with privately operated networks that monitor private space. We are particularly interested in linking with the traffic cameras operated by transportation agencies in D.C., Maryland, and Virginia, giving us real-time information on traffic flow and bottlenecks during major events or evacuations. We have already successfully tested a linkage with the CCTV system operated by the D.C. public schools. This type of real-time visual information would be extremely valuable in responding to a Columbine-like incident. And we have begun discussions with Metro about linking with its video system and stations and platforms. In all of these instances, there is one critically important safeguard. Access to these systems is controlled by the agency that operates the cameras, not by the Metropolitan Police Department. With the public schools, for example, there are strict protocols governing access to their CCTV system. Only the schools, not the police department, can activate the system, and only the schools can allow us in. With respect to privately operated video networks, the Metropolitan Police Department is not linking with such systems now, nor do we have any plans to do so. We have absolutely no interest in peering into the private activities of anyone. Fact number three, the Metropolitan Police Department is very carefully evaluating any expansion in a neighborhood-based cameras. Currently, we are able to access a camera mounted near the corner of Wisconsin Avenue and M Street Northwest in the Georgetown Commercial Entertainment District. That camera was purchased by the business and professional community, which then approached our department about monitoring the public space images from a community policing center in Georgetown. Our department agreed to this request in part because we want to evaluate the operational feasibility and public safety benefits of a neighborhood-based camera. In recent weeks, our department has received several inquiries from other community groups requesting CCTV in their neighborhoods to help combat robberies, thefts, and other street crime. And we're carefully studying the issues involved, including cost, scope, and length of operation, resources needed to monitor the cameras, and privacy issues. With any neighborhood-based installations, there are certainly principles that we'd follow. First, any cameras would have to target a specific crime problem for which CCTV technology may be beneficial. Second, there would have to be extensive dialogue with the community about the deployment of cameras and widespread community support for their use. Fact four, as technology has advanced, our policies and procedures have not always kept pace. One of the concerns raised by ACLU and others and shared by myself and other MPD leaders was that policies and procedures governing our use of video were not as specific and formalized as they should be who could activate the command center, who controls the cameras, what images would be recorded, if so, how long would the tapes be retained. These are legitimate issues that need to be clarified. Over the last month, our department has initiated a fast-track process to develop new, develop new policies in this area. We are currently finalizing a new department directive for the mayor's review and approval on the use of CCTV. The development of stronger policies and procedures will not only enhance public confidence in the system, but also safeguard against any possible abuses. And finally, the Metropolitan Police Department does not view CCTV as a panacea in achieving either neighborhood safety or homeland security. It's just one more tool that can support these efforts. Our intention is not to somehow transform policing in our city from a neighborhood-based community policing strategy into one that hinges on CCTV. This technology, when used properly, can support community policing, but I know it will never replace community policing. We are in a unique time in a unique city, a city that faces not only serious crime problems, but also the very real threat of terrorism. 
and the Metropolitan Police Department has a unique responsibility of protecting not only our residents, but also the millions of people who come to our nation's capital every year to work, to visit, and to petition their government. Given the enormous challenges we face, I would argue that it would be irresponsible for us not to use every legal tool at our disposal, including video technology, to help protect our city and ultimately our democracy. We will continue to use these tools judiciously, responsibly, openly, and with strong public oversight. Thank you. Th thank you, Chief Ramsey. Uh, John Parsons, the Associate Regional Director of the National Capital Region of the National Park Service. Um, and then um, we'll give you a chance to catch your breath, Ms. Kellams. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and uh, Mrs. Norton. I'm sorry. Good. There we are. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and uh, Mrs. Norton. I appreciate the opportunity to present the views of the Department of Interior on the issues of privacy and security with respect to the use of su electronic surveillance in the nation's capital. And the National Park Service is pri privileged to have the responsibility for managing some of our nation's most treasured symbols, including ones in the monumental core of Washington, D.C. The monumental core includes the Washington Monument, the Lincoln, Jefferson, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt memorials, the White House complex, and the Korean War veterans and Vietnam veterans uh, war memorials. For several years, the National Park Service, with the guidance of the U.S. Park Police, our urban law enforcement arm, has been working on enhancing security in and around the heavily visited Monumental Corps. Numerous studies have been conducted by the National Park Service and its consultants in recent years to assess potential threats to the sites in the Monumental Corps. The level of security present and actions that should be taken to increase security and thus minimize the risk of danger to those who visit these structures. One recommendation, which is commonly common to nearly all of the studies, is the use of closed circuit TV. A 1999 study of the Booz Allen Hamilton, uh, which focused on terrorist threats, recommended the instra installation of CCTV and all of the monuments and memorials within the monumental core. Although the process of planning the CCTV uh, system and obtaining funding for it had begun prior to September 11th, the installation of this technology became a higher priority after the tragic events of that date. Installation of CCTV at sites in the Monumental Corps is part of a larger effort to increase security at National Park Service sites that may be at high risk for terrorist activity for, for which the administration is seeking substantial increases in the fiscal year 2003 budget. The budget requests include an increase of $12.6 million for the uh, U.S. Park Police in Washington, D.C. and New York City to fund additional recruitment classes, equipment, and overtime. It also includes approximately $13 million at the Washington Monument, $6.2 million at the Lincoln Memorial, and $4.7 million at the Jefferson Memorial for vehicle barriers, security lighting, and associated improvements. And it includes an increase of $6.1 million for increased security at park units across the country that are national icons as well, such as the Statue of Liberty, Independence Hall, the Arch of Western Expansion in St. Louis, and Mount Rushmore. The National Park Service is not currently using any CCTV in the Monumental Corps area. However, within the next six months, we plan uh, to have CCTV installed at six sites, the Washington Monument, the Lincoln Memorial, the Jefferson Memorial, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, the Korean War Veterans Memorial, and the FDR Memorial. Park Police personnel will continuously monitor these cameras at a Park Police facility. The current plan calls for the images to be recorded on a continuous loop, which will record over itself after a yet-to-be-determined yet period of time. Recording the images will allow the police to save any that are needed for evidentiary purposes. The estimated cost of the system is approximately two to three million dollars. The National Park Service plans to use cameras monitored by the U.S. Park Police only in public areas where there is no expectation of privacy. The images that are recorded would be used only for valid law enforcement purposes. At this time, the National Park Service is planning to install CCTV only in the Monumental Corps area. We do not have any plans to use any other type of surveillance technology, such as facial recognition types of CCTV. The U.S. Park Police operate in New York City and San Francisco, as well as Washington, D.C. In New York, the Park Police have cameras in place on the Liberty Island and in the Statue of Liberty. 
that are monitored on a continuous basis with a loop recording system. Park Police personnel in the New York Field Office are working on plans to upgrade the entire security system in the vicinity of the Statue of Liberty, including using di digital CCTV. In San Francisco, the Park Police have not installed any cameras and do not have current plans to do so. However, the Golden Gate Bridge Authority <coughs> utilizes numerous cameras on that facility, which is directly adjacent uh, to our park. In summary, we see CCTV as uh, used appropriately as a cost-effective and non-intrusive way to monitor and protect larger areas than would be able to be protected with available personnel. It is thus an important tool that can help the National Park Service safeguard the national treasures under our stewardship and the people who visit them. Madam Chairwoman, that concludes my testimony. I'd be happy to answer any questions I may have stimulated. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Parsons. We'll get to the questions in a, first, in a few moments, but right now I'd like to swear in uh, Margaret uh, Nettlekoff Kellams, the Deputy Mayor of Public Safety and Justice. So if you would stand and raise your right hand, uh, Ms. Kellams. Do you swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Affirmative response, and uh, now we'd love to hear your comments. Good morning, uh, Chairwoman Morell and Congresswoman Norton. Please accept my apologies for being late this morning. Uh, I'm Margaret Nadelkoff Callums, the Deputy Mayor for Public Safety and Justice, and I thank you for convening this hearing on a very high profile and often misunderstood topic of the district's use of CCTV as a tool for ensuring the public safety. I'd like to take just a few minutes to outline the Mayor's priorities and concerns regarding the use of this powerful tool and what steps we are taking to ensure that our practices are judicious and relative to our needs. Chief Ramsey has already discussed the specifics of the current operation of the system and the policies and procedures that MPD is drafting to govern its operation. Mayor Williams uh, has consistently identified neighborhood safety and quality of life among his top priorities for his administration. Since the events of September 11th, homeland, or in this case, hometown security, has taken on a new significance, particularly in our nation's capital. Mayor Williams continues to stress that in our pursuit of these goals, we must take great pains not to unduly impact the personal privacy interests of our citizens, the many people who work in our city, and the more than 20 million visitors who visit annually. CCTV is not a new law enforcement tool. In fact, law enforcement has been using CCTV for years as a means of collecting criminal evidence. As you may well imagine, without CCTV, MPD would not have nearly the success it has had in closing down many of the drug markets that impact our city. Of course, what we're talking about today is substantially different than using video technology in targeted law enforcement efforts. And we appreciate the opportunity to discuss this issue in an open forum with you today. As CCTV has moved to the forefront as an effective tool in ensuring the public safety and protecting against threats to our city, Mayor Williams has committed to an open dialogue and discussion of the benefits and concerns on both sides of the issue. We recognize that engaging all of the stakeholders in the development of our system, both as security experts and those seeking to protect, the, protect our privacy rights, is the only way we will come to an acceptable result that everyone can live with. The Mayor has been very clear, and all of the stakeholders agree, that the primary objective of this system is to enhance public safety during major events, times of heightened alert, and actual emergencies, whether or not they are terrorism related. During these times, law enforcement resources are our most valuable commodity in, term, in terms of ensuring safety and peace. CCTV is tremendously useful in helping us allocate and manage those resources effectively. Instead of relying on radio call-in information from officers scattered around the event or the city, officers whose field of vision is limited to their immediate surroundings, CCTV allows us to monitor large and distant areas quickly and unobtrusively. That information allows us to redirect officers, know where, law, uh, where reinforcement is needed, and anticipate where we might need other types of equipment or response. This information assists in protecting the public as well as our first responders. In fact, the utility of CCTV at major events was proven before September 11th. MPD leased video technology equipment during the IMF World Bank demonstrations, the inaugural and even the NBA All-Star Game to assist in resource deployment during those events. Based on those successes and in, anticip in anticipation of the planned IMF World Bank meetings and demonstrations scheduled for the end of September last year, MPD began the development of a small video network capability in its Joint Operations Command Center. 
Since September 11th, MPD has expanded the video network to approximately one dozen cameras focused on areas of potential terrorist threats and has been pursuing linkages with the video systems operated by area transportation departments and Metro. Even while we pursue the use of CCTV in these kinds of situations, Mayor Williams has asked MPD to explore the possible future uses of technology for controlling crime on a daily basis. Of course, that's a big step from where we are now, and there are many, many issues that must be considered and evaluated before we move forward. Questions regarding individual privacy rights, as well as important operational concerns like the location of the cameras, how they're monitored, by whom and from where, are the, video, uh, are the video feeds re tape recorded for evidence, and how long and for what purposes are those tapes maintained? Would have to be worked out in great detail, and MPD is already engaged in that process. It is important to note that CCTV is not intended to be a primary neighborhood policing tool. There is no substitute for the security offered by the presence of officers patrolling the neighborhoods themselves. That said, we must be responsive to the public concerns about the potential uses of CCTV once that, uh, once that capacity is in place. Several neighborhoods have requested that cameras be installed in their communities, hoping that it would have a deterrent effect on criminal activity, and perhaps even assist in capturing and prosecuting criminals. Certainly, there will be disagreement among different communities regarding the appropriateness of CCTV. Bear in mind that at the core of MPD's policing philosophy is respect for the interests of its communities. Chief Ramsey's Partnerships for Problem Solving model has as its core value that police are to work with the communities to solve problems together in a way that is acceptable to all involved. But the fact remains that in, cer in some places, in certain communities, stores, or at ATM machines and around government buildings, for example, video monitoring equipment has helped control crime and convict criminals. Mayor Williams has instructed us to, in uh, to assess the benefits and burdens of these applications to determine whether, on balance, CCTV as a community crime-fighting tool is effective, even as we move increasingly more patrol officers onto the streets to work with our citizens in their neighborhoods. Chief Ramsey has explained more fully the Times location's deployment of these cameras, but I want to reemphasize that the cameras are an extraordinary tool for an extraordinary time. We are not monitoring the streets of the district around the clock and listening in on people's conversations. We don't even have the capability to do that. We are not tracking the movements of individuals around town or in private buildings. We don't have the capability to do that. Nor are we using video to identify individuals, such as through biometric imaging. We don't have the capability to do that either. Rather, this is a prudent, limited, and legal use of video technology in support of our goal of ensuring peace and public safety during extraordinary times. Mayor Williams believes that we owe it to our residents, workers, and visitors to be vigilant, innovative, and careful in how we pursue that goal. Therefore, we monitor a limited number of public spaces during special events or at times of heightened alert, as announced by the federal government. And as Chief Ramsey has explained, MPD is currently finalizing its operating policies and procedures for those uses for the mayor's review. I thank you for the opportunity to testify. I would be happy to answer your questions. And again, I apologize for being late. Yeah, thank, thank you, Ms. Kellams. Um, I'm going to ask you as I start the round of questioning for about five minutes and we'll rotate, um, it, it, to answer as succinctly as, as you can so we can get as much information in a, in a short time. First of all, to, to uh, Councilwoman uh, Patterson, the council has approved, I think it was emergency legislation requiring the uh, submission of policies and procedures for the system uh, for approval. I'm curious about when you will be receiving um, these policies and procedures. Um, even more than that, what standards will the council use in evaluating the adequacy of the policy and procedures, especially for the public areas that involve federal facilities in the nation's capital area. And then um, connected to that, does the council plan to consider any legislation uh, adopting standards for the use of, of uh, stored video information that would be gathered through electronic surveillance? Thank you. Thank you, um, Congresswoman. I believe Chief Ramsey has indicated that the department is developing draft guidelines for use of the technology, and it's those guidelines that the council, um, by emergency legislation, asked to come to the council for active review. Um, I'm not sure what the time frame is. I know the chief had indicated um, a 30-day turnaround time in meeting with the ACLU, that the, the um, tour of the facility that he mentioned. In terms of what we will then do, 
I anticipate that we will consider whether it's appropriate to do legislation, and I think it may well be. And in this, I would just note that our own citizens are a bit ahead of us. As I noted in my testimony, the Federation of Civic Associations came up with some a list of issues that they would like to see addressed in legislation, including civil and criminal penalties for abuse um, and providing for destruction of tapes not needed for evidence and such. I think these are issues we should look at. As to standards, I am not familiar with the, um, the two sets of national standards that I understand have been developed, but I am delighted to know that they exist and we will certainly be reviewing the ABA standards and the other standards that have already been developed on these issues to see what we may learn from those standards. I'd like to ask, um, following up on that, Chief Ramsey, uh, has the Metropolitan Police Department reviewed the standards that were recommended by the American Bar Association or the guidelines that are recommended by the Security Industry Association and the International Association of uh, Chiefs of Police? Um, for, for instance, uh, both recommend that notice be given to subjects that they are under surveillance. And that ties in with the community input and what are we doing about uh, about letting uh, letting the community know when they're going to be uh, under surveillance. Uh, yes, ma'am. In addition to that, we uh, also have gotten guidelines that are being used in other uh, countries uh, to try to take a look at best practices as it relates to the use of uh, CCTV as we draft our own policies. We do have a draft directive now. Uh, I've seen that. Uh, I sent it back for further work and it's being staffed now by other members of the department, including our, our uh, general counsel. Um, and I hope to get that back within the next couple days. And um, then we'll be getting it over to the mayor's office and to the council. Uh, so yes, we are, there, there's a lot that uh, we're reviewing and looking at. Uh, just yesterday, in the mayor's office, uh, the deputy mayor, myself, the mayor, the uh, a U U.S. attorney, spoke with officials from um, Sydney, Australia. Uh, and talked a lot about their policies and their guidelines, and they have sent that to us uh, to review as well. So we're really reaching out as far as we can to look at best practices. So you believe that you'll have some kind of policies that you'll be recommended and practices that you feel are appropriate that you'll be submitting to the, uh, to the mayor and the council. Um, that will include community, how you advise the community? Yes, ma'am. It just seems to me that's a very important facet of yes, it, uh, that people are not taken by surprise and have justification. Right now, I think you said you have, what, 12? Yes, ma'am, we do. We have 12 cameras that are owned by us. Um, they are, we've, we've sent you the locations, the primarily um, locations where we feel we need to keep an eye on in light of the terrorist threat is primarily what we're uh, concerned about right now. Um, and we, we also had some problems early on, if you recall, about having officers actually um, assigned to certain locations. Uh, what this does is almost as a force multiplier. It allows us to be able to uh, keep an eye on certain uh, areas that we feel are very vulnerable, but not having to actually put an officer there. What federal agencies have allowed you to install cameras uh, on their facilities to survey uh, uh, public areas? Well, um, I'd have to get back to you with a complete list. I know one of our cameras is, is mounted on the uh, Department of Labor, uh, the roof of the Department of Labor right next door to us at 300 uh, Indiana Avenue, and we can get uh, a very good shot of the Capitol uh, from there as well as the uh, Washington Monument. Um, Union Station um, is another um, location where we have a camera mounted. Uh, the old post office, that's right, the old post office. I do have a list here you, that I can provide to I, you. I think you've given us a, a, a list, Chief Ramsey. I, I'm curious about who in those agencies granted permission, mm -hmm. and um, is there any written agreement um, among the, the agencies or how the cameras will be used and how long it will be stored, anything like that? I don't believe there's any written agreement, ma'am, and I'd have to check with uh, Steve Gaffigan, who as my Office of Quality Assurance to find out who specifically they spoke with there. But we did get permission prior to uh, putting any we cameras would be, up. We would be interested in that, too. That gets into the policies and procedures uh, for it. My time has expired. I'll, I'll get to you in my next round, Mr. Parsons and Ms. Kellams. And so now I, I defer to the ranking member for five minutes.
Could I ask how, how these cameras first became known to the public? Actually, ma'am, um, they became known during um, the April 2000 IMF World Bank demonstrations is when we first used it. No, and no, 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 that's no not my secret. question. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to get at something else. I want to know when they became known for the public. For example, when Ms. Patterson first knew of these cameras. I mean, I would consider her an example of the public knowing as opposed to the police department. No, I appreciate that. I, and I how did you come to know about it? I think I could, I know the extent of the capacity from a tour that I did of the, of the police command center fairly recently, within the last six months, um, the center that became operational right after September 11. I'm talking about in the terms surveillance of, the of, of, of citizens. I think I became aware of that in the course of uh, concerns expressed by some of the demonstrators in 2000 and 2001. They expressed concerns about um, the issue, but in terms of, of knowing the Well, of course, the that's during the a demonstration. That's during right. a demonstration. I'm talking about the use of cameras, the use of the network to surveil uh, people who are not involved in demonstrations. Uh, when did the council, when was the council put on notice that this was happening? I'm not sure we have today been put on notice that precisely what you describe is happening because it's my understanding from, from the deputy mayor and from the chief that we are not, as a matter of course, using the technology apart from major events. Well, that, that brings me to my next question. Um, the, uh, the, um, the chief testifies that we're using these major events, we're going to use it in emergency. Mr. Parson testifies that the park police personnel will continuously monitor the cameras at a park police facility. These are, of course, cameras that go into our command center. Um, Ms. Kellams testifies, as you may well imagine, without video surveillance, MPD would not have had nearly the success it has had in closing down many of the drug markets that impact our city. Um, Mayor, William, Mayor Williams has indicated that this city should have a system such as the one they have in England with and of course, that involves 2.5 million cameras. So I'm real confused here about the, what appears to be the difference in federal policy, city, po city policy. I'm, I'm confused about the notion of notice. It's one thing to it's one thing for demonstrators to find out they're being surveilled. It's another thing for the council to be given a tour, and it's another thing to have notice and comment, so that ordinary members of the public can know about what amounts to a major step that uh, it seems to me people are at least entitled to know about before, not after, the cameras are already set up in spots. So first I see uh, policy differences. Uh, and next I want to know why there was no notice and comment before this was done. And finally, Ms. Kellams, you need to explain what the mayor wants to do, since you represent him, whether we're on our way to London and a vi video on every corner. Please, please don't include Ninth and East Capitol, where I live, by the way. <laughs> Save yourself some money on my block. But go ahead. Oh, I'll start, and I'll, I'll let the chief speak to it. I, I, of course, can't speak to the federal policies about how often they're going to be using these and monitoring these. The but you don't. But you don't. But you haven't coordinated that with them. You, you, you heard his testimony today, and yes. so what they do, they can do as much as they want to with your system. I'm sorry, it's their system that they're doing this independently. We have, on occasion, when we've brought up our command center for major events, asked if we can access their feeds. We do not have this on a normal, ongoing basis. We don't monitor their system at all, and they monitor it separately. What is the relationship between their, their system and your system? They're separate. 
We have the they ability. They have no, no relationship to the command center. They have. We have the ability when we want to access their system to do that, which we have limited to public events and vice versa. We do not uh, have our command center up and running and monitoring their feeds except during major events. Go ahead. Uh, the, as, as for the comment about the drug market, and I can let the chief explain it more fully, I, I was uh, speaking in, in, in generalities that I probably shouldn't. We, those are not mounted permanent CCTV cameras. I was speaking to the use of video technology when it, uh, the police are, are engaged in an activity around a particular drug market that's a very different type of technology, and those feeds are not going into our command center. I was just referring to the use of, of video generally. The mayor's position is that to the extent that these are useful tools, he would like MPD to, to give him some uh, uh, advice and do some research on how they're used in other places, and London is among them. As the chief mentioned, we were speaking with the folks from uh, Sydney, Australia last night. Their policy is exactly the opposite of ours. They do not use them for major demonstrations. They use them in crime hotspots. Uh, they have found they, they they claim and they're sending us the information that this has been an ev an effective deterrent tool. But we're very much in the investigative point. We have not moved into using these on a regular, ongoing basis or using these in the neighborhoods at this point. Uh, Mr. Parsons, on, 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 on the basis of what evidence have you decided a 24/7 uh, around the clock um, surveillance is effective? Well, we are uh, convinced by studies and, and uh, consultants that these uh, icons of democracy are high targets uh, for terrorist activities, and, and that is the sole purpose that we, uh, we are, have made the decision to go forward with planning for these cameras. My, my, my time is up. Madam Chair, could I respond to the portion of that question that was directed to the council, All right. with your leave, just very briefly, there is a and not on my time, but yes. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. There is an issue, I think, between what is operational practice by law enforcement and what is public policy, where the legislature, on behalf of the public, needs to be involved. And I think you might find a distinction of opinion, even on this panel, of where that line is drawn. The council, I think, it's clear, should not sign off on an individual video stakeout of a corner drug market. But the council should sign off on what is our policies for maintaining videotapes from demonstrations, for example. So I think there is some, there is a little tension here in terms of what belongs to the policymakers and what is day-to-day -day law enforcement operations. And of course, there were no policies in place whatsoever when these camera, when this surveillance first began, and there is no written policy in place as I, as we speak. I think that is critically important that we bring it all together and find out how one links to the other, the nexus. Uh, Chief Ramsey, did you want to quickly comment on that one? Well, I just think it's a very important point to note that to, that to date we haven't been recording anything. And we haven't because we don't have the policies in place. So this is simply observation at this point in time. They're not being recorded. We have the capacity for recording, but we have not recorded. And I just think that's a very important point to make because we understand the sensitivity. I don't disagree with Council Member Patterson that the role of the Council is to um, um, uh, help us and, and to pass legislation that, that helps set some of these guidelines so that we can safeguard against abuse. And that's what we're trying to do now with uh, draft policies, reviewing all the literature that's out there now around how different uh, cities and indeed different countries handle uh, these very, very sensitive issues, but we have not recorded anything, nor will we until did, we did get you policies Did you record place. during what the World Bank International no, Monetary Fund? No, no recordings no, were made at that time, too. No, ma'am. Right. Uh, Mr. Parsons, uh, on that issue, what does it mean, um, as you stated in your testimony, that images will be recorded on a continuous loop? Uh, the continuous loop means a, a device that can be recorded over itself after a period of time. Continuous loop tape. So you are recording? Well, at the current time, we have no cameras at all installed. You so are planning. So we're still in the planning stage, and that was that is our intent, yes. What standard do you plan to use uh, to determine uh, when the recordings will be erased? I know you told me you haven't done it yet, but when you do, what? What are you going to do in terms of how long you're going to keep them and when they will be erased? 
this is all part of the planning process and we really haven't come to the point of, of determining that. I think it's probably a good thing that we have this hearing now too because we can, we can kind of prompt you to see why you need to work together in partnership to see what is, I mean, I mean for instance, as we get back to um, uh, the uh, Metropolitan Police Department, uh, is the federal uh, government uh, at the monumental core going to link up with the command post, uh, the command center in the District of Columbia? Th or that is that would, something you're thinking about? That would be our intent, yes. That would be the intent that it would be, it would be connected. Let me ask you also, since you've talked to Australia and London and uh, other countries, how effective um, are cameras in combating crime uh, or preventing terrorism? Uh, what were the results of the research um, that you may have uh, read about or undertaken? Uh, do you believe that cameras are a deterrent to crime? And if that, in fact, is the case, can we expect that there will be a reduction? We've been reading a lot about crime in the newspapers lately, with it, that there would be a reduction in crime uh, where they are deployed? Well, um, if I may, uh, certainly cameras are not a panacea. They're not going to end all of our problems. But one thing that we learned yesterday in our conversation with officials from Sydney, 10 percent of their arrests are the result of their CCTV system. 10 percent of all their arrests. That's a lot. And um, last year, if my memory serves me correct, and I was taking notes uh, yesterday, so hopefully I took good notes, but 735 assault, arrests for assault were made last year uh, as a result of these, um, these cameras. Um, again, that is, I think, uh, something that um, uh, we have to pay attention to. Um, again, these are street assaults that are uh, taking place. Um, again, as far as we're concerned, uh, I'm sorry, that was 783 assaults since January of 2000. So that actually, co actually covers a two-year span. Um, I just found my notes from last night. But they did say that 10 percent of the arrests that they make uh, come from that system. So again, does it stop all crime? No. Do they have it posted? Absolutely. Right in the neighborhoods, clearly posted. This neighborhood uh, uses video uh, um, CCTV. Uh, and, and we would be looking to do, um, do the same here as have it posted. You know, jumping into another subject that you reminded me of, there are no postings right now in the District of Columbia for any of your traffic surveillance cameras. I've, had, I've, heard, yes, from, I've heard from constituents yes, in District of Columbia residents who had no idea that, that, uh, that this was an area Ma'am. Yes. If I may, the Please. red light cameras are posted. The, um, the photo radar uh, right on our website, we put the locations of where we're going to be working. Um, there's no way to actually put a sign up because th those are mobile units, uh, but we do post it on our website. For exceeding the speed limit, I mean, that, the, those? We actually post where we're going to be. I guess people aren't looking. I'm going to start <laughs> looking myself now. They aren't looking at the website, and in some cases, they're not looking at their speedometer either. <laughs> You know, I've had people who've contacted us who've said, you know, I got this $100 ticket and I didn't even know that I was exceeding the speed limit, had no idea, and I have, you know, how do I appeal? Do I appeal a camera that, you know, that records this? Um, all right, the district's Department of Transportation uh, plans to install 100 traffic cameras around the district. Uh, this I would direct to you probably, uh, Deputy Mayor Kellams. Uh, does the district plan to link those cameras to the system? We'd like to. Those cameras are intended for traffic management, uh, particularly during a, a, an emergency. Uh, but we'd like to use them at all times to just sort of manage our, our terrible traffic situation here. We were uh, planning to put them at major critical intersections and some of the uh, commuter routes in and out of the city. We think it would be useful to have that if we had, for example, a, a, an incident like we did on September 11th when we're trying to evacuate most of the people from downtown or they're self-evacuating, that that would be useful information. It's police officers and National Guard who are usually deployed to the intersections to manage the, the traffic. It's expired, but uh, Mr. Parsons, did I hear something about um, 
700 new cameras that would be um, employed in the District of Columbia that would include areas where the park police has jurisdiction? Uh, we I mean, like are, Rock Creek. Uh, we have been approached by the Department of Public Works mm -hmm. uh, with a, uh, a uh, map of the city that shows, uh, as we understand it, 700 cameras. Very few of those are on Park Service jurisdiction. They would, they would uh, monitor traffic up along Rock Creek to the zoo, for instance, Rock Creek and Potomac Parkway. Um, and, and we're just in the preliminary stages of that, but uh, that was my understanding was 700 cameras. Who gives authority? I, mean, I don't know from whence the authority for establishing these cameras comes. Different authorities? And do they ever come together, or is that something we're going to be looking at in the near future? Well, ma'am, as far as law enforcement goes, we do come together on a regular basis. In fact, this afternoon, through the Council of Governments, um, I'm participating in a uh, meeting of all the regional law enforcement agencies around our regional emergency response plan. And we talk about a variety of issues, including uh, being able to work together uh, through our joint um, command center. Uh, so there is ongoing dialogue. Um, and, and I think it's important to, to, to maybe clear up one issue as well. Um, our goal is to tap into um, existing CCTV networks, but in order to do that, we just can't um, just start surfing the, the area and, and, and looking for images. We have to have the cooperation of the other agencies. School's a good example. If they don't, if they don't turn on their switch on their side, we can't, we can't get that feed, and we would only do it and if in the event of an emergency inside a school. So you can tell them to do it, that they should report to you? Right. We can, we can, we can, can, we can ask them and request, and they would more than likely be making the request of us, uh, quite frankly. Um, those areas during a time of a terrorist threat, our agencies would get together and we would provide access to one another automatically because of the nature of the threat. So they could get our feeds, we could get their feeds, but we're in a, a state of heightened alert and it would make some sense to do that. You use a criminal justice coordinating uh, council? That is certainly another vehicle that could be used. It hasn't yet, but it certainly could be used uh, in that fashion, although many of the agencies that are represented uh, at, in the CJCC aren't necessarily those agencies that would have uh, camera networks. You know, it would be awfully helpful to the subcommittee if you could in some way give us some kind of a chart to show how yes, this all works out. Yes, ma'am. Maybe you could all work together in doing that. I now recognize Ms. Norton. Thank you very much. The, uh, the chair's uh, reference to the CJCC is a very important one because even though not all the agencies are included, uh, essentially what you have in this city is the beginning of a model for what's going to happen elsewhere and it may become a model for how people coordinate. Uh, let me make my position clear. I, I think you are on the horns of a dilemma. And I think you are trying your best to sort out uh, this situation. Uh, in the process, it seems to me, uh, and the, the, the difficulty I have with what the mayor said about London and the rest of us is, is that it does not show the appropriate balance. Um, it does seem to me that every step of the way, the second question has to be said, how do I limit this? How do I control this? And, and th 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 that is a concern I have about the testimony here. I don't hear that part of the equation being raised except through the council hearings. I want to ask who has paid thus far for the DC cameras and for the link of the DC cameras uh, to the federal facilities, the White House uh, and so forth. Who has paid for that and out of what funds, out of what part of the budget did it come? Uh, the funding came from our capital IT as well as our capital, um, I guess, facilities funds, you would, you would, you would call it, uh, has funded this uh, thus far, not from our local budget. I can't hear you. Uh, do you expect that the homelands, we, we got a rather handsome homeland security amount, do you expect that any future funding will come out of homeland security funding? I think that would be appropriate uh, a use of it, and in fact, the cameras that we were referring to from the Department of Transportation uh, were funded through home, through the, the federal appropriation for emergency preparedness. Um, Mr. 
Mr. Parson indicated that um, essentially what's being done here is to surveil public uh, spaces, not individuals. Mr. Parsons, what, since you are surveilling public spaces and not individuals, um, that's somewhat comforting. What exactly are you looking for? These, these cameras, as we uh, are planning for, uh, would be inside the, the chamber of the Lincoln Memorial, for instance, uh, and f also focused on the entry stairways. Oh, this is important. You are you you are inside. Uh, correct. Not all right. A and and focusing on the uh, on the approach stairways, so it it is it is simply there uh, to to uh, anticipate any uh, anything that could occur on a 24-hour basis. Mr. Parson, does the park is the Park Service also working on rules and guidelines that would help your personnel? know how, where, when, et cetera? Well, certainly as it relates to how long we're going to keep this information, yes. And how long are you going to keep this information? Well, we're, we're not there yet, but uh, certainly this, this hearing has is, is, uh, brought us to the realization that we need standards and policies. Well, how, you're, you're absolutely right about how long you're going to keep, it, keep the information, where they should be. The reason I ask, Mr. Parson, is you indicated that apparently different federal facilities have different policies. You went down a list of park department facilities, mm -hmm. some of which were, some of whom were using, some of whom were not. So that there's obviously not even any uniformity within the federal government. Uh, do you intend that all park service facilities will have the same view of these? Um, that's uh, our that's our objective. Yes. Uh, do you do you anticipate that eventually all park service monuments uh, will have these? cameras throughout the United States? Uh, I don't believe so. Only those that have been identified as, as a high threat. Um, could I ask about the schools? Uh, excuse me, Mr. Uh, Chief Ramsey had a... Ma'am, I just wanted to add one thing from, uh, from MPD's uh, perspective. Right now in our draft policy, we're looking at 72 hours as a period of time, if anything was recorded, that would be kept unless there was some criminal activity, which would then, we, we would obviously maintain it longer for, um, uh, for evidence. Mm -hmm. um, we are looking at, and yesterday we found that in, in Australia, for example, they keep theirs for 21 days. Why? Because they want a period of time if there's an audit or something, um, there's time for people to review the tapes. We fully support a, a pro an audit process, and that's going to be part of our directive and something we work with the council on to see to it that it takes place in our system as well. I believe that if someone calls and says, hey, we want to see the tapes from a given day, we just hold those tapes. So I don't know if you need to really hold them 21 days or not, but I think we need to have a time frame that's sufficient for review by interested parties that want to, that want to review it and, um, and not keep them too long. So that's that's where we're at as far as our policy goes. As far as what we'd be looking at, if a truck pulls in front of Union Station in an area where trucks aren't supposed to be and is left unattended, we can get on the phone and call uh, security there and say, hey, you better go check out that truck or dispatch a scout car because it could possibly be a truck bomb. I mean, that's the kind of thing we're looking for, unusual suspicious activity that would necessitate the dispatching of a scout car to check it out further. Almost inevitably, then, the the, the police department is going to be sharing this information with federal authorities almost inevitably. Absolutely, ma'am, because the Union Station example, we wouldn't dispatch a scout car unless there was some reason why we couldn't reach the security that's already at Union Station, and that's part of your your plan with your with the legislation you moved around the cooperative effort between agencies. They're part of that agreement, and they would, they would uh, respond to that request. Uh, my time is passed. <laughs> We both seem to be on the same wavelength, uh, Congresswoman Norton and myself. I'm picking up on what you said, Chief Ramsey. Who, who would be the interested parties? I mean, That's something that, ma'am, it could be the it could be the council, it could be ACLU, it could be you, it could be uh, someone who wants to take. I mean, we would have to work that out through some kind of of uh, process uh, where uh, we would agree that that a, a, a some group could come in and. Um, spot check and take a look and see what we're doing. I mean, we're not trying to hide anything no, here. No, so. and, and actually, I, I really meant it just the opposite. I mean, are there going to be some criteria you will establish in terms oh, absolutely. of who would have access? You just wouldn't want anyone who is just curious. Exactly, it would have to be. Uh, mm -hmm. 
um, and you, you said you keep, you keep these uh, records uh, or the camera tapes only for 72 hours. Uh, that's the draft policy right now. We haven't been recording, but, one of the, but the time span we're looking at right now, the, uh, the, our, at first blush, was 72 hours. That's not saying that there was any, any, anything about 72 hours that was, I mean, I've seen some policies that uh, 96 hours, yesterday we learned 21 days. We need to find something that's reasonable here, work with the council if they find it reasonable and all parties find it reasonable, and then put in place a mechanism where if, if there were someone who were the auditor, let's say, to come in and, and periodically review these tapes, there would be sufficient time for them to be able to do it, and we would simply hold it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, and to, to Mr. Parsons and the, uh, uh, the park uh, service, I, I have a feeling that you're going to say this is a work in progress, <laughs> because I would ask, <laughs> what standards will you use to ensure privacy rights are protected when you install the cameras uh, at the various uh, facilities. I'm afraid I'm going to have that to give you the same answer. Okay, so, so it's good that I pose it for the record, too. Yes, absolutely. Because you will definitely look into the privacy uh, concerns. But I, I will also pick up on, we're going to have on our next panel, imminently, um, the American Bar Association, and we have already talked a little bit about the fact that they've come up with uh, uh, some standards. I wonder if are you familiar with them? Um, do you plan to use them when you're installing the security devices uh, at the Monumental Corps and the park sites? No, we have not studied them at all. Okay, great. Well, then, mm -hmm. you, you really have an agenda before you, and I hope that you'll report back. I hope all of you will report back to this, this committee, knowing that what we're trying to do is achieve a balance. This was really kind of a fact-finding uh, hearing because we think it's uh, exceedingly important to know where, why, how long, standards, privacy, community input. And so, Ms. Norton, that was really my final question. Just a few, a few, a few more questions, Madam Chair. Uh, Chief Ramsey, I have staunchly defended your red lights here in the Congress and on <laughs> another, in another one of my committees. Uh, uh, I was I was quick to indicate that you have saved lives in some substantial numbers that people in the district have clamored for them because people were being hit by cars and otherwise injured and because you had limited the system so that uh, of course you took only a picture of the uh, of, of the um, license plate there were some valid criticisms the council uh, raise those, the criticisms of, of, of who was running it, how people got paid, you're attending to that. I, that's the kind of model, I think, of what we'd like to see here. Nobody expects us to get it all right in the first time. Nobody's used, no society has used these kinds of, of cameras before. The real question is limits and, and, and protections. Um, uh, I, I'd, I'd like to ask, um, about the use of the cameras now. I was comforted that you used them during the Winter Olympic Games. You used them during times when there were clear, there was a clear need. There has been an attack, and I'm, I'm not willing to, to, in, to, to assume there'll never be another attack. I wonder if you are looking to use the cameras uh, when they are specifically uh, in, in a specific emergency, whether you are coordinated now with the federal government's new color-coded co alert system, so uh, that we all know when when an alert, what an alert means. There was a, um, I believe, a 60-day period for comment um, with this particular system that um, Governor Ridge um, um, laid out for us just a week or so ago. Um, we are looking at that. Um, um, I don't have any, you know, cutting edge comments around it, quite frankly. I think the more important issue is that we all be on the same page. Yeah, that's really my only question. When they come to an understanding of what, after the notice and yeah. comment page, and by the way, they did it the right way. They did notice and comment so we all know about this, so you can have a say. At that time, you will calibrate yours yes. to the federal. Yes, ma'am. Uh, let, me, let me ask you, Chief, about um, an example you gave that, uh, that that is in tension with the notion of emergency use only. You, you, you talked about 
an emergency at Union Station and you'd be able to send somebody there, well, that indicates uh, consistent use of the cameras of, of the kind that the, the Park Service is doing as opposed to use of the cameras uh, only in emergencies. So all the cameras, in, 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 for example, at Union Station, which I take it are our cameras, are they going to be on the same 24-7 basis that that the Park Service cameras are? No, ma'am. I was referring, and I apologize for the lack of clarity. I was speaking in terms of when the cameras are activated during this period of time. Should we observe this kind of activity, then we would, we would do that. Otherwise, the cameras would not be on. Today, for example, the Joint Command Center is being used for training for our crime mapping, which has no, no camera capability at all, but it is our new crime mapping system, and we have crime analysts in there learning how to use the new system. So it's really a multi-purpose room, um, not just for uh, CCTV. I, I must ask about the schools. Uh, what are we, lo first of all, if these are going to be hooked up to schools, does that mean we're going to have a camera in every classroom, uh, in, in every auditorium, in every hallway? How could we possibly hook these up to schools? Well, first let me ask Ms. Patterson, how were they used at your daughter's school? The, the closed circuit TV at, at Alice Gill Junior High School that was put in place in 1996 was a security measure to net so that you didn't have to have people walking all over the school grounds at any particular time, just as you do in any kind of closed circuit television security system in a public building, to enable one person to sit at a bank of cameras and see the full exterior of the school. And since that time, the school system has moved to that kind of technology, I believe, for the junior and senior high schools first, and then moving into the elementary schools. I'm not familiar with what is planned for internal uh, up to the buildings of the D.C. public schools, although I know they do at least have one camera that uh, inside the, the office of the school system. So I'm not quite sure what they're intending to do on the interior of buildings. Perhaps Chief Ramsey or Ms. Kellams could tell us what your intention is with respect to schools in particular. If we were to have a Columbine-like incident, um, we would uh, request the ability to be able to tap into their um, to their CCTV system, their existing that, system, their existing system that they have in the school, and that would help us know where the gunman was located in the in the school, for example. Where do we need to get kids out? Where are the evacuation routes uh, that would be best taken in light of where the incident is occurring versus where students could be safely evacuated? What route should our cars take approaching the scene if the gunman is in the north? east corner of the building. We don't want our cars coming in from the northeast because they, uh, they, they sniper fire. Uh, so it would help us be able to isolate the incident a lot, a lot easier than having our emergency response team go in having to do a physical search to get the information an hour and a half later that they could have gotten in moments. Now, this is an important distinction. If, you, if these cameras exist, we're talking about halls, we're talking about uh, the kind of cameras that are already in use, we're not talking about an add-on, a bunch of cameras in schools. Uh, uh, one of the dilemmas we face here, I, I'll say finally, is that, um, to take the Union Station example, if the chief had the band power to put a hundred cops there to look, then nobody would say that there was anything wrong with that kind of surveillance. If what we have instead is a camera that replaces the hundred cops, the dilemma we face is, is that any different? We know that because it is surveillance, there are some differences. One of the standards we might use is to, t to try to equate as far as possible the kind of surveillance that police ordinarily do with the kind of surveillance we're talking about here. If anything, the kind of surveillance that my neighborhood policeman does is probably more invasive. He probably looks at my face. He probably remembers things about me. But we are used to him. Uh, this is considered a part of ordinary law enforcement. What we're going to have to come to grips with is uh, what difference it makes when we make this cosmic leap and whether we need special safeguards in light of that kind of leap. I thank you very much, Madam Chair. I thank you, Congresswoman Norton. Um, I want to thank you for being here. I do want to ask you to, re to report back to us with regard to 
the standards that you are establishing, even as you consider them, your time schedule, um, policies, and, uh, and uh, public input opportunities and plans. Um, and uh, we would appreciate that. We'll also get to you some, some questions about the red light cameras, which we didn't feel was the focus of this, this hearing today. But I do want to thank all of you for being with us. Uh, Ms. Patterson, Ms. Kellams, uh, Chief Ramsey, Mr. Parsons. And I'm going to um, ask that there be um, a five minute recess and then we'll get to our second panel. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, call back into our hearing, our second panel, as we resume the subcommittee hearing. Um, thank you again for your patience, too, and for being here. Johnny Barnes, Executive Director of the American Civil Liberties Union of the National Capital Area. Ronald Goldstock of the American Bar Association. And John Woodward, Jr., a brand. So, gentlemen, may I ask you to stand and raise your right hand also to be sworn in. Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Again, affirmative responses um, by all of the panelists. So again, if you'd proceed about five minutes each uh, with your testimony, and I think you probably noted that we alluded to some of the points that you're probably going to be bringing out with the previous panel, which demonstrates that your testimony was very, very helpful. So we'll start off then with you, Mr. Barnes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm delighted to be here in these familiar surroundings, Congresswoman Norton. I gave roughly a quarter of a century of my life as a staff person to Congress, uh, sitting behind those seats in which you all sit very often. Uh, I can assure you that the perspective from this seat is very different. Um, you have my uh, testimony. I'd like it included uh, in the record. And, in its entirety, and I'll summarize. Without objection, it will be. The ACLU believes the district should abandon its plans to establish a British-style system of surveillance cameras. There are five compelling reasons that drive our belief. Surveillance cameras are not effective at fighting crime. They don't work well. Surveillance cameras reduce resources for placing police into neighborhoods where they are needed the money can be better spent. Surveillance cameras undermine individual privacy and are inimical to our way of life. We have Times Square in America, not Tiananmen Square. What are we doing to our icons of democracy? Surveillance cameras should not be contemplated without the permission of those they impact. Such permission has not been granted by the people of D.C. nor by their elected representatives the D.C. Council. Surveillance cameras are subject to great abuse. Young and minority citizens already face the burden of profiling by the police. They should not have to carry the additional weight of being singled out, tracked and traced by the camera's eye simply because of their age or the color of their skin and for no other reason. And women should not face the additional indignity of leering eyes peering through the lens of a camera. Yet that is the sad legacy that is being left where these cameras have been tried in other places around the world and across the United States. I'll briefly exp expand on these five reasons. Cameras do not make us safer. Instead, they give the public a false sense of security. As you noted, Madam Chair, despite 
2.5 million cameras in England, including the 150,000 cameras in London, where the average citizen is filmed 300 times a day. The murder rate in that capital city is at record levels, and street robbery, the very crime these cameras are supposed to prevent, will soar to 50,000 in this year alone. Madam Chair, cameras don't catch crooks, cops do. That is why Detroit, after a decade and a half, and other cities, many other cities throughout the United States, have abandoned this adventure of surveillance cameras. Surveillance cameras require an upfront investment in technology and require ongoing maintenance. In addition to monitoring the video screens, police officers must be pulled off the street and put into the video control room. A camera can't stop a mugging or a murder in progress on the streets. A police officer can. The use of video surveillance cameras goes far beyond a change in the style of life as we know it. The use of these cameras will change the Constitution as we know it. The terrorists are winning. No longer will we feel free to sunbathe in our backyards because helicopters mounted with cameras can fly over and film residential neighborhoods. They are already equipped to do that. And I believe, Madam Chair, those are additional cameras beyond the dozen or so to which Chief Ramsey referred. No longer will we be able to have the expectation of privacy in a restaurant in Georgetown. Merchants there have asked to join this network of cameras. And let me just say, Madam Chair, I believe already you are making a difference. You're having an impact with this hearing because the representations unsworn, not under oath, that have been made uh, in recent weeks and months have been inconsistent with some made today. And so, as you point out, this hearing and hearings that will follow is effective in flushing out the facts and getting to the truth. Now, perhaps we, because we've had different spokespersons, uh, the inconsistency is, is there, but it is there. So powerful are these cameras that they can film a belt buckle a mile away. So strong is surveillance technology that some allow the viewers to see through clothing. We first learned of these cameras when we read in the Wall Street Journal on February 13th that the plan for their use, quote, go far beyond what is in use in other American cities, end quote. And that's Mr. Gafgan, uh, the gentleman who's coordinating the program with the Metropolitan Police Department. On that same day, Access Communications the Australian firm that constructed the district's new system told us that this system would be used, quote, in support of everyday policing. That's what the firm that constructed uh, the system said in a press release. General sweeping surveillance of all of us rather than particular specific surveillance of those among us who act out terror, who commit crime. Mayor Williams confirmed that in an interview on March 8th in the Washington Times. And Chief Ramsey, the following day, March 9th, repeated the assertion that the district would have a British-style system. This hearing is very important, and the hearings that will follow are very important. We need answers. Is this system designed to help prevent terrorism or catch terrorists? Or is this system to be used for general law enforcement? When will the system be on? Who will monitor it? Will the system use biometrics? Where, how long, and by whom will records be kept? Will there be laws and regulations governing this system? We need a body of laws, a set of regulations, not policy guidelines. Today, we do not know all of the answers to those questions. Without this and other hearings to explore these issues, tomorrow may be too late. Finally, the abuse. Law enforcement says trust us. Perhaps if Chief Ramsey or Assistant Chief Gaynor monitored the system on a daily basis, we would more likely trust them. But the muddied history of this nation has given rise to far too many occasions where the courts and our legislatures have been forced to impose controls because law enforcement could not be trusted. A young black attorney who knew his rights was nonetheless stopped and searched on a major highway because the police had a written memo, a policy guideline, profiling, uh, allowing profiling of uh, young uh, black men as probable drug dealers when they're in rental cars driving along I-95. 
A D.C. police lieutenant followed and sought to blackmail gay men who frequented certain establishments. And law enforcement says, trust us. Imagine the damage to lives and other situations uh, this could have caused if bad apples in law enforcement had the additional power of the camera's eye. These cameras will watch all of us, not just those bent on crime. I close with a bit of history and perhaps an admonition that I believe presents interesting comparisons, if not striking similarities. In, 17, in 1790, a Congress seeking security from a band of P Pennsylvania militiamen sacrificed liberty and enacted Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17 of the Constitution, the District Clause. More than 200 years later, because of that provision, we still have a British-style system in the nation's capital. And I know you're sympathetic to that cause, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Barnes. Very well presented. I'm now pleased to uh, recognize uh, Ronald, Ronald Goldstock of the American Bar Association. Thank you for being here, Mr. Goldstock. Yeah, I am the uh, chair of the ABA uh, Criminal Justice Section Standards Committee and past chair of the section. Um, I am pleased to have the opportunity to share with you the work, um, the fruit of our labors from the ABA Criminal Justice Section Standards Committee. Um, standards become ABA policy and they've been used extensively by courts uh, and practitioners and we are particularly pleased with its use in establishing legislative and regulatory policy. The Task Force on Technologically Assisted Physical Surveillance, or TAPS, that we're discussing today was, I believe, composed of the type of people that Ms. Norton suggested be on her proposed National Commission. Uh, they were prosecutors and defense attorneys, academics, members of the judiciary, police, privacy advocates, and liaisons from a number of interested entities who worked uh, very closely with the committee, uh, entities like the FBI, NSA, NACDL, uh, major chiefs of police, NLADA, and the individual rights and responsibilities section of the ABA. The task force considered uh, a variety of issues from illumination and telescopic devices like flashlights and satellite surveillance, detection devices from heat emanating from homes to x-rays at airports, and tracking devices from car beepers to implanted chips. We also looked very carefully at video surveillance. And in doing so, we tried not to limit it to present technology, but considered that anything that we could think of was possible, and we devised standards with that in mind. The standards uh, relate to a variety of possibilities. If the video surveillance is of private activity or conditions, then we would require a warrant, and in fact, constitutionally required, uh, required. We would go somewhat further and require an eavesdropping warrant in those situations. If uh, the surveillance were to be long-term overt surveillance, I think primarily the type that you're talking about today, then the decision to do so would have to be made by a politically accountable law enforcement officer or a relevant other politically accountable individual, the mayor, for example. Um, if the purpose of that s t surveillance, uh, the long-term overt surveillance, were investigative, then there would be a, a determination made by that political, politically accountable individual that it would be likely to achieve a law enforcement purpose. If, on the other hand, its purpose were deterrent, then it would require that notice be given prior to the time that the surveillance were installed, notice be given while the surveillance were there, and that there would be hearings before and during the surveillance so that the public would have a chance to comment, make known their views, and a determination based upon those views. Obviously, if it is going to be deterrent, um, there would have to be notice, otherwise uh, deterrence would not work. If the surveillance was short-term and covert, um, then there would need to be um, a determination that a legitimate law enforcement objective could be met. Um, 
and the decision could be made under those circumstances, that is to say short-term, covert, um, by an officer who was not necessarily politically accountable uh, because presumably the investigative demands would require that it be done immediately, uh, it be done for a short period of time, but it, that it cease upon the attainment of its objectives. We suggest all of this in the context of general principles, that there be no targeting in a discriminatory fashion, that there be an attempt to use less intrusive means before video surveillance is used, and that transactional data, the recordings themselves, be destroyed pursuant to some policy that was developed by the law enforcement authorities and uh, the political structure um, so that there wouldn't be the type of abuses um, that Johnny Barnes suggested. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goldstock. And uh, as I mentioned, um, as I introduced this panel, we have alluded to your ABA standards in our previous panel. I, I assume that the standards, either in black letter or completely, will be made part of the record. Indeed, they will. Thank you. Without objection, so ordered. And Mr. Uh, John Woodward, Jr. of RAND. Thank you for being with us, Mr. Woodward. Thank you, Chairwoman Morella, Ranking Member Norton, and members of the Subcommittee on the District of Columbia. I'm honored to participate in these timely hearings to discuss electronic surveillance. In the interest of time, I will focus my testimony on policy options for Congress to consider and concerns related to future use of video surveillance and other technologies. Let's briefly establish the legal status quo by asking, does the use of this technology violate legally protected privacy rights? The District of Columbia's proposed use of video cameras to monitor public places does not appear to run afoul of the protections afforded by the United States Constitution, specifically the unreasonable search provision of the Fourth Amendment. Congress, of course, is free to provide greater privacy protections than those found in the Constitution. Thus, we next need to ask, what options can Congress pursue with respect to government use of surveillance cameras? It seems Congress has three broad policy choices. First, prohibit the use. Second, regulate it. Third, take no immediate action pending further study. Congress could decide that the use of surveillance cameras is so dangerous to citizens and society that the law should prohibit it. In other words, the law could treat surveillance cameras as a form of technological heroin to be outlawed. The counter argument is that surveillance cameras are not a form of technological heroin because unlike heroin, their use benefits the individual and the community. Specifically, the community must maintain public safety. To fulfill this essential duty, law enforcement must monitor public places. This age-old concept is the rationale for the police officer on the beat. To extend the analogy, a surveillance camera can be viewed as a form of mechanical police officer that watches or records events occurring in public places in which a person has no reasonable expectation of privacy. Congress could decide to regulate the use of surveillance cameras in many ways. Most notably, Congress could enact time, place, or manner restrictions. For example, Congress would re could restrict government's use of surveillance cameras to the duration of a planned protest, time, to monitor only those sensitive locations deemed susceptible to attack, place, and to prohibit continuous video recording manner. Or as an alternative, Congress could require prior judicial branch approval for the technology's use. The third option is for Congress to continue studying this issue, remaining poised to act. More and better public policy research on the use of the technology, its security and privacy implications, as well as the effects of regulation is needed. One controversial issue that Congress may consider concerns what the government does with the data it collects. A recording capability can be helpful for criminal investigation in the form of post-event analysis. For example, it's good that we have videotape of Muhammad Atta at the screening area of the Portland Main Airport at 5.45 a.m. on September 11, 2001. It's bad that the Washington Metro CCTV system did not have a recording capability on June 10, 2001, when an assailant fatally shot Metropolitan Transit Officer Marlon Morales at the U Street Station. If surveillance data are recorded, however, then policies for data retention, data security, and auditing, along with penalties for misuse, should be considered. 
transparency and active oversight should help build citizen support. Both the public and private sectors are making growing use of electronic surveillance technologies as well as other emerging technologies that can gather information about us, thereby significantly increasing the potential privacy invasions. These developments do not necessarily mean that Big Brother is alive and well. Rather, these same technologies can be used to protect citizens' rights. For example, with respect to the use of video cameras. In 1991, a bystander videotaped the arrest of Rodney King. This video allowed many Americans to see for themselves what otherwise would not have been seen. Currently, many police departments have installed cameras on squad cars to video certain traffic stops and similar events to show that officers satisfy legal requirements. In the near future, a citizen wearing a mini camera on her jacket lapel may be, able, may be able to effortlessly video her encounters with law enforcement or anyone else and wirelessly transmit the information to wherever she desires. In conclusion, we should be mindful of technologies that may invade our privacy, and it is wise to monitor their development to forestall potential abuses. We should also, however, ensure that perceived or potential threats to our privacy do not blind us to the positive uses of video surveillance. Rather than acting hastily, it might be better to first try to develop thorough answers to questions about the use of surveillance cameras, as this hearing has tried to do, to determine the camera's impact on public safety, as well as the policy and social concerns they raise. Thank you for inviting me to share my thoughts with you. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Great. I want to thank, uh, thank the three of you for appearing before us and so succinctly giving us a synopsis of your, um, of your work on this issue. I'm going to ask some questions that would be directed to actually to all of you. Um, I'm wondering, first of all, have any jurisdictions um, in, that have installed electronic uh, surveillance systems adopted the standards that were recommended by the ABA? You're probably the first one to, to um, have no, a response I, to that, Mr. Goldstein. Uh, yes, I, I don't know of any. Okay. Anybody else know of any? Okay. Um, when did you come out with them, as a matter of fact? Anyway, it was two years was your mm -hmm. task force, as I recall. I mean, I maybe, can, maybe they're that uh, recent. 1999. Um, 1999? The commentary, yes. Uh, they came out towards the end of 1999. Okay, great. Well, it's very interesting that, you know, nobody knows about any jurisdiction that has utilized um, that, that work. Okay, would you say that the recording of images and the use of recorded images in databases poses the greatest risk to civil liberty? Any of you want to comment on that? I mean, is that the having it in databases, do you think that's a, a real threat? Mr. Barnes? Absolutely, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, because what we will um, be exposed to in that case is, is this idea of mission creep and how far will it go? Will uh, persons who have uh, done other things considered to be wrongs in society be excluded because they didn't pay a traffic ticket or they didn't uh, pay a judgment uh, into the courts? Uh, the collection of information and the storing of information of, about individuals is a very dangerous thing. Let me just uh, say that uh, I know of an example of a bank that uh, got the information, the health information about their patrons and those who were uh, uh, suffering from cancer, they called in their notes. In other words, you're about to die, give us our money. So there are many abuses that f flow from the storing, the collection and storing of, of this kind of data. Uh, Mr. Chairwoman, if I may follow up, uh, is the recording of the images and storing them in a database the greatest risk? I'm reluctant to give it an order of magnitude. I think it's certainly a risk that deserves the attention of members of Congress. Uh, I think Mr. Barnes' concern about function creep or mission creep is well placed. That's uh, sadly uh, an example that we see from history with much use of data that is stored. There are frequently other reasons found why that data be can, use, can subsequently be used in ways never intended, with the social security number being a great example. Um, I would also add, I think, another concern that members of Congress will face in the future. You'll have this data if you decide to store it, 
And there may be very, very good and compelling reasons why you want to store the data. For example, it may be very helpful for criminal investigation, post-event analysis work. At the same time, you'll see growing technologies that can also collect information about people that might become interlinked in a type of a surveillance network that I think could be profoundly troubling for many of us in society. And, and I would also add that it's not the public sector that has the monopoly on the use of these technologies by any means. This is also something that you'll see extensively in the private sector. So I think you've rightly called this hearing to focus attention on this, and I, I think that this will continue to be an issue that will occupy much of your attention as policymakers. What, what do you think about the 72 hours that the uh, that Chief Ramsey mentioned uh, for keeping that material? Mm -hmm. Ma'am, this is in reference to the uh, Metropolitan Police Department's right, draft right. regulation that would call for a 72-hour storage period. I think that there definitely needs to be a time limit as far as how long the data is going to be stored. Uh, I don't have enough specific knowledge of the situation that... Uh, mm -hmm. But it seems to me a good start. Okay. All right. And, and you mentioned the... Uh, you both mentioned uh, Mission Creep. And you mentioned technology coming online so quickly. I mean, the idea of, of having a little camera on our lapels as, we, uh, as we're out in the evening or, or in certain areas. Um, how do we guard against it? What do we do to guard against it? Uh, whoever would like to answer that? With, with so much new technology coming online. Mr. Barnes, you want to try it? Yes, Madam Chair. Um, again, I think we need a, a body of laws and a set of regulations, just as we have uh, with respect to uh, search warrants, uh, with mm -hmm. sanctions and uh, criminal sanctions and civil penalties for abuse. Um, and there has been abuse. It's well documented, well reported. Uh, I think that's the best way. Uh, the, the concern is that this is, has been a, a uh, unilateral action uh, by the executive branch, cutting out the legislature, cutting out the courts. And uh, the genius of our system of separation of branches is that we do have checks and balances, and that's why the courts and the legislature need to be involved. We need a body of laws, a set of regulations, if we're to have these cameras at all. It seems to me that we're talking about a number of different things, and, I, and they have to be answered separately. One question is what government can do, mm -hmm. um, what they're allowed to do, and whether or not that should be regulated by uh, laws, by the Constitution, by policy, um, by regulations, all is a matter that we need to think about. The second is government's access to private databases. Uh, there are huge databases that are built up both commercially and in other ways. Every time you use a, an easy pass to go through a toll or go into a parking lot, there are records maintained that can be retrieved. And we need to to know what the government ought to be able to obtain and under what circumstances and how individuals, uh, individual companies, entities can share that with law enforcement. Uh, huge companies that, uh, um, that are retailers, when you go and you know you, uh, they ask you for your telephone number when you make a purchase, uh, collecting data about you. When they send you a package in the mail, they know where you live. All of that exists. Uh, links can be made uh, internally within those retail stores, and they can be provided to law enforcement either on their own design or by request of law enforcement. And we ought to be thinking about how we're going to regulate that. Mm -hmm. Finally, it seems that there is the possibility of violations of law by individuals, um, whether or not it would be a crime, for example, to somebody to broadcast a, um, a picture or overhear a communication. Uh, and that, obviously, is subject to law. Uh, there are eavesdropping laws that regulate that, um, and there might otherwise be other laws as the capabilities and technology increases. But I think these are incredibly complex issues yeah. that need to be studied, and to suggest that there's a simple answer, um, I think, is, is uh, probably incorrect. Right. May I add to that, uh, Chairwoman Morella? With respect to mission creep, I think it's important to point out that mission creep itself should be really viewed as a neutral term. Uh, that is, one person's mission creep might be another person's worthwhile mission advance. And let me try to give you an example. Uh, in the testimony I heard earlier, it seems to me that the Metropolitan Police Department currently proposes using video surveillance for special events, special occasions, and the chief gave examples. Well, it might be that over time that 
instead of just using the surveillance on a limited basis, the community might want to use it more on a regular basis, or normal daylight hours for regular standard law enforcement purposes. Uh, with the use of special cameras that have a night vision capability, you could see how that would be expanded to a 24-7 capability, that the surveillance could become wider, it could become deeper, et cetera. But I think you might be faced with the question of what do you do when the community, be it the local community, uh, or at the state level, or at the national level, actually approves this use and wants this kind of mission extension, if you will. And to give you an example, some of us might think, well, it's really silly to use video surveillance to deal with the problem we have of people who are smoking illegally in certain public areas. And we're going to train the sur surveillance cameras on that area to try to identify these people so that we can prevent this practice and we can cite the uh, people who are committing the infractions. But it's difficult if you have a community that goes through public debate, engages in the democratic process, and decides, well, in our community, we have a real problem with people who want to smoke illegally in public areas, and we want to stop it. It's difficult. Some might look at that and say, well, that's really a silly and unwarranted use of the technology. But to others who are exercising their democratic rights, they might see it as something they really want to stop. So I, I think it's a very difficult issue. I think we're all agreed on that perspective. Well, the difference is mission creep versus mission enhancement. Tell them what you call it. Great. Uh, Ms. Norton. Mr. Woodward, when you get into the notion that the community can decide that it wants cameras for any purpose, there's a consensus. You and I would have a deep, I have a deep disagreement with that because there is a Constitution of the United States and I can imagine all kinds of things that, that there's a consensus about that would not pass constitutional muster, I think and I hope. Uh, Mr. Barnes, it's clear in, as you opened your testimony that the ACLU is trying not to be a bunch of Luddites uh, to, that simply oppose the cameras uh, wherever they are found, that you recognize that the cameras uh, exist, that, that the cameras uh, in, for many uses have not been struck down by courts yet, that they have been challenged. You say that we should abandon, that the, I'm sorry, that the district should abandon plans for a British-style system, which of course is a wholesale system. In light of, by the way, of, of that opening uh, in your testimony, let me indicate that your reference to profiling suggests to me uh, that we're talking about exactly the opposite of profiling. And st profiling is, is honed in on specific individuals because of certain characteristics. Here we're talking about, about uh, wholesale profiling. Everybody is a target, and it's hard to know which is worse um, for everybody or some of us. Um, but, but I do see, as I listen to the testimony of all three of you, uh, the, the willingness to try to work this through, to come to some, uh, to, to recognize that it's difficult to come to some kind of, of solution that, that all could embrace. Uh, uh, Mr. Goldstock, my commission is a little broader. Your commission, uh, I want to compliment the ABA. I didn't know of your work. I want to compliment the ADA for getting out in front of this issue. Uh, you seem to have been focused on surveillance cameras. The reason mine is broader is that I would hope that the Presidential Commission obviously wouldn't be involved in regulations, would provide general guidance uh, across the board uh, on how to meet how a society remains open. It includes things well beyond surveillance uh, because there are so many approaches being thrown up. Uh, nevertheless, your work, I think it would even be important to what it is I'd like to have done. I mean, my commission is going to have on it not only lawyers and security officials, but philosophers and historians and psychologists and architects, people who can bring to bear the society so that, the, so that we can have some balance here. And your work will be important, it seems to me, if, if a commission is ever established. Uh, I'd like to see, I'd like to see whether or not um, uh, there could be any agreement among those of you uh, seated at the table on the framework for an accepted policy. Uh, Mr. Goldstock's testimony mentions um, technique capable of doing what it purports to do, trained officers solely uh, for specified objectives, terminated when the objectives achieved, notice, deterrence, um, uh, uh, it, 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 notice so there is a deterrence, I would say notice so that everybody knows what's happening as well. 
um, maintaining uh, or disposing of these records, uh, written instructions, uh, et cetera. I see something approaching the components of a uh, acceptable uh, policy, and if I could add to that, uh, the testimony from the city about audits so that one could, in fact, see if, in fact, what is what, 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 what you said should happen is happening, uh, no database. Uh, could I ask you whether the components I have just named are, as far as the three of you are concerned, the framework uh, toward an acceptable policy, and if not, what should be added? Or uh, is there some other approach you would suggest? I would First, say Mr. yes. Mr. Bar <laughs> yeah, uh, Mr. Goldstein. I, I don't have any problem with it. <laughs> uh, I used yours because it laid out some. I, I had, of course, one or two from D.C. And, and I'd like to ask Mr. Barnes, who I think very uh, usefully raised these issues in our city, whether or not the uh, ABA policy, plus some of the things that the district may be doing now that the matter is public, could uh, form the framework for an acceptable national policy. Well, Congresswoman, as you note, uh, our position is that we don't believe the cameras serve any useful purpose. But as you also note, uh, some cameras are in place, others perhaps are contemplated. And so uh, we would suggest that if, if uh, there is to be some system that a body of laws and a set of regulations, certainly uh, those uh, put forth by the American Bar Association, uh, reach many of the concerns that, uh, that we have. And we'd be uh, happy to work with others in trying to shape and mold a, uh, a, a body of laws and set of regulations that uh, uh, reflect uh, a concern about civil liberties. Yes, uh, I, I appreciate that, that response. Uh, Mr. Woodward? Yes, Congresswoman Norton. Um, I think you cited, I was trying to keep a checklist, uh, and I think I got most of them. I think you mentioned that, uh, so that, that the legal framework should have something like notice, where people should have notice that the surveillance cameras are being used in a particular area. Yeah, two kinds of notice. Notice to let us know so that we can comment on whether they should be used and notice that they are there. That they, right, the, right, the, um, we can, do, we, I, I think you need both, basically. Uh, I think it's very important to iron out your policies or your regulations that are concerned this whole issue of data retention, what you can keep in the database. Uh, similarly with the data security and auditing function, as well as some kind of an oversight mechanism. Uh, I think also you mentioned the idea of penalties for misuse, and I think it's appropriate for, common, for the Congress to look at criminal and civil penalties, because you certainly want to deter that kind of behavior. Uh, I think also the important aspect to this is transparency and, and getting input from the community as far as what's the right way to work this process. Uh, now, transparency, of course, is always difficult. How much transparency? But I know that uh, I, I've, I've even considered ideas, and I included in my written testimony the idea that the operations of these video surveillance cameras could be made known to the community by broadcasting some of their activities on a public access channel or on a website so people could literally see that this is what our government is doing in these areas. Uh, thank you. My time is uh, up. I only uh, have a few more questions, Madam Chair. May I just oh, excuse make me, one thing uh, clear that, that the ABA policy relates, uh, with respect to notice, relates to overt long-term surveillance. I mean, if the surveillance were being used for an investigative purpose, if uh, they knew there was going to be a break into a liquor store, obviously, uh, you wouldn't be giving notice at that point. I mean, that's right. with a warrant. No, no. Without oh. a warrant, on a public street, but focused in on a particular area for investigative purposes, notice would not be required. Probable cause, and, and therefore the no, cop no, is... No, 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 Well, I mean, the cop is not just there in front of somebody's liquor store. What do you mean? What I mean is if the, pr the police, for example, had information that uh, a group of burglars or they have uh, a tip. robbers were breaking into liquor stores, and there weren't sufficient number of cops to be around protecting everybody, you might want to set up cameras at a variety of stores in that neighborhood aimed directly at the stores. That would not require a warrant but you wouldn't want to give notice because the object was investigative rather than deterrent. Could Mr. Barnes comment on that hypothetical? Well, um, 
If, if I may, Congresswoman, uh, I feel obliged to say, because I may not get another opportunity, that I've worked with both your staffs, and you have excellent staffs. Um, I think the, um, the hypothetical is a specific situation involving a particular circumstance. And the trouble we have with the surveillance cameras is that they are general and sweeping. And, and I think that as a standard would also be important, to focus on particular situations, specific circumstances, not unlike we do with uh, Fourth Amendment procedures. Yeah. Thank you, Congresswoman Norton. Um, you, you all heard in the first panel that the Council um, has passed emergency legislation that requires that the uh, Metropolitan Police Department submit policies and procedures governing the use uh, of, of the uh, surveillance uh, and, and asking for approval. Um, do you think that that approach is going to be sufficient to ensure that there would be some regulation of the system, adequate regula regulation of the system, or is that just a beginning? Well, again, uh, Madam Chair, we believe that uh, uh, the effort to uh, put some controls and, and guidelines need to go far beyond the police issuing uh, some statements about what it might do or will do. Uh, there, it needs to be etched in the law uh, and have the force and effect of the law. And there need to be um, an opportunity for those who uh, are victimized by abuses to have access to the courts to enforce uh, that law and, and those regulations. So we need more than policy guidelines. That's okay. our firm position. Do, do I hear? Do I hear? And I, I know you want to comment on that, but maybe, maybe um, under the uh, umbrella question, do I hear the three of you saying you really do think that Congress should, maybe I should say at some point, come in with standard recommend maybe maybe standards instead of saying recommendations. Um, standards, um, policies, procedures, auditing, uh, san auditing devices, sanctions. Are you saying there should be legislation that is drafted to address what you have uh, presented to us in terms of the, um, the, the problems that could be inherent with uh, camera surveillance? Do you uh, want to start with Mr. Goldstock? Yeah, I, I think that the ABA standards could be the basis of uh, legislation. I think it would uh, work quite well. I think the legislation, as you suggest, is only the first step. Uh, within it, there has to be training and transparency and auditability mm -hmm. and accountability and oversight. I think, and I think I'm in agreement with Johnny Barnes on this, that, that in fact the, the real issue here isn't the initial policy, although I think that's important. It is consistency. It is in demonstrating to the public that the policies are being followed, adhered to, that there aren't abuses, uh, that if there are issues that come up, they're attended to, that maybe there should be a change in legislation or policy if there are consistent abuses, um, that uh, the legislation or standards or regulations change to meet current needs and current technology. Um, I think that's what's critical. This is an ongoing process. It is not the beginning uh, formulating a manual and then stopping there. Uh, this is a continuing process, and I think that's what's necessary. It should be federal? I mean, uh, uh, should it be jurisdictional? It um, be well, I think uh, the broad the broad guidelines ought to be federal. I think yeah. uh, the same way it is in electronic surveillance. Um, but the electronic surveillance statutes, for example, lay down bare minimums, and different jurisdictions decide whether within that they ought to make uh, changes and make it more restrictive. And I think that is the same kind of policy that would work here as well. So kind of bare minimums allowing for some flexibilities and customizing for different areas. Uh, Mr. Woodward. Yes, uh, Chairwoman, I think that you are at a starting point, and you could look to a uh, federal regulatory framework for at least how you want federal agencies to use the technology. And then you might want to consider, mm -hmm. should we also include state, local, tribal government use of the technology as well? Uh, one other point I would urge you to consider, and I think we've seen it as far as the testimony 
presented this morning before you it seems to me there's a lot of disagreement as to how effective surveillance cameras are in terms of preventing crime detecting crime investigating crime countering terrorism it seems to me we've heard uh, different knowledgeable people offer different perspectives on that point uh, and it, it just seems that um, one one area congress might want to further investigate is to try to determine some answers and i realize it's very hard to develop the metrics so that you can get answers to questions well is this technology really cost effective and so on um, I, I do understand that there's been a lot of reference made to the united kingdom's use of surveillance cameras by their government agencies and i just wanted to call the subcommittee's attention to the fact that the parliamentary office of science and technology which is a very very rough United Kingdom equivalent of your own Congressional Research Service, will be issuing a report in the very near future, I understand, on the topic of surveillance cameras. Now, that might have some helpful insights as far as how the United Kingdom uh, Parliament perceives the use of the technology in that particular case. Uh, and also, I would just note from an international perspective that uh, our neighbors to the north in Canada have taken a rather different approach in some ways to the use of surveillance cameras to monitor public places. Privacy, uh, Privacy Commissioner Redwinski has issued a letter, although it doesn't have the force of law, he outlines his comments and his views of how the technology should and should not be used. And apparently there is a disagreement among various uh, lawmakers in Canada as far as what the policy will be there concerning government use of surveillance cameras for public areas. May I just quickly add to that, Madam Chair? I want to join with Mr. Woodward. Uh, I think it would be useful to find out whether or not these systems have been effective in other places. Again, um, um, I know of a report that came out of Sydney, Australia, and Chief Ramsey referred to certain uh, data from Sydney, Australia, uh, in December of 2001 uh, that indicated that uh, these cameras had helped with one arrest every 160 days. Uh, that's different than what the Chief told us, so it would be, I think, a useful exercise to find out the effectiveness of these cameras. How long have they had it in London? I, I, I don't remember the... In London, in England, in England uh, the yeah. system was first put in place following the uh, IRA bombing in 1994, uh, second one in 95, and then when the, the little four-year-old was uh, kidnapped, it, it just mm -hmm. proliferated. Um, and... Um, uh, in Sydney, Australia, I'm not sure how long they've had it. Right, right. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Norton. Uh, th uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, oh, I, I think it was Mr. Goldstock that mentioned the, um, the, the necessity for consistency. I was troubled uh, by even the Interior Department testimony, Mr. Parsons, uh, sense that, that various park service facilities, that's only one Department of the government were essentially uh, on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. We saw what happened in this city when federal agencies proceeded on a case-by-case -case basis. You know, barricades went up. All kinds of rights were violated. Uh, parking meters uh, off when it came to some federal agencies, not bothered with respect to others, violation of uh, district law with respect to barricades. Um, the, the point of consistency does lead me to, the, to believe that some federal action, guidance of some kind is necessary. The case, you know, we work brilliantly in this country on a case-by-case -case basis, but that assumes that there is a law or a basis by which to judge the case-by-case. Uh, how we go about that in, if we are the federal government, um, it becomes problematic. At the very least, it does seem to me with respect to federal facilities, there is an obligation. We probably should begin there before we, because we are just learning, before we begin um, to tackle uh, our national responsibilities. Would you agree that if we were, we're going to proceed in some kind of federal policy making, that we should proceed first with federal facilities? Um, and do you think that should be a matter of law or some kind of executive order or central guidance? 
well it seems to me that the federal policy whether it be for federal facilities or even for local be minimum standards it seems to me that that's what can be done the best to have a sense of consistency throughout the country and to put into place the kinds of policies and formulations that you agree exist after after hearings in these studies but it does seem to me that there ought to be a great deal of flexibility with respect to individual incidents and questions of whether or not there are particular needs in particular jurisdictions either because law enforcement is not broad enough or it hasn't enough people they have to enhance their resources there may be particular problems that exist I should also say that in considering this it's not clear to me that it's always privacy versus law enforcement sometimes there can be an accommodation between the two mr. Woodward suggested that things like cameras and police cars can have a salutary effect on the relationship between the police and the public it seems to me cameras that record certain events can can clear people when witnesses testify to things that aren't accurate and the cameras demonstrated it leads to please and gets rid of cases fairly early if there is documented evidence of the criminal activity that might otherwise be fought so I and it may be possible for example not to have any conflict where there's an indication that cameras are up but in fact they're not working they act purely as a deterrent without any compromise of personal privacy so you know I think there is room for a wide range variation is no longer the very variation you suggest suggests that if somebody doesn't put some limits on what those variations may be that they will be all over the map and I think that's exactly right I think the limits should be there I think that's what Congress ought to be doing its minimum standards and limits you can operate between certain guidelines and then you have to make determinations based on your own particular needs just where you're going to be mr. Barnes of course congresswoman the mayor and DC Council have the authority to set standards and limits with respect to the Metropolitan Police Department but we've also we also know that the Secret Service is there the Park Service US Marshal Service the Park Service you know mr. Parsons testified so there are areas that are purely within the purview of the Congress in terms of legislating and and providing some guidance to the federal agencies we would of course prefer the local government to provide that guidance to the Metropolitan Police Department at the very least I think the district should proceed and if and perhaps they can what they do can be instructive to anything anything that the chair and I might agree upon look the district has the largest police force per capita in the United States that's even if you don't count the federal police here has always had the largest a very high crime rate as I speak you know there's been a spike in crime in one neighborhood and people are calling for more cops one wonders I'm back to my I'm back to my example there's there's a certain point at which 10 cops we have no objection to but one camera that does what 10 cops would do we do and I hate to I hate to to put another law professor hypothetical to you but at some point one has to come to grips with the fact that at least in some of the instances we are talking about for example mr. Parsons gave a very hard case because there's no question that you could have a park police right there inside the Washington but they looking for somebody who would go and put some kind of explosive device there and one way to do it is to station yourself a police officer there I'll give you another example I am in discussions with the with the, with the um, 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 house uh, on their closing the um, 
stair, the West Front stair. Hideous thing to do. This is one of the great historic vistas. You know, really goes back to Long Farm. And I'm in discussions about uh, opening it up at least some of the time. And we're getting somewhere on how to do it. Now, what I've suggested is you could put a police officer, it would be a Capitol Police officer there for the period in which it would be open, and then we could open it, at least for that period. Now, what am I to do if the sergeant at arms with whom I've had the most serious discussion says, well, Congresswoman, we have just gotten enough police to cover, had, it took us a long time, and only September 11th got us enough police to cover what we, we need, but I could have a camera there and the West Front could be open the way it always was. I mean, so I put those, I put that hypothetical to you and ask you if that is the suggestion that I am offered, should I take it, given the outcry, that one of the great vistas to the Capitol and to, the, uh, to, to our city has been closed because there is a real danger. You really could come up those stairs and put a device right under uh, a major part of, w of what the capital is just by walking up the stairs. What are you going to do with that one? Well, again, uh, Congresswoman, uh, I think that's why it's important to really study uh, whether or not these cameras make a difference or do they give us a false sense of security. Um, I know, for example, they had for over a 22-month period uh, cameras were trained uh, uh, in Times Square, concentrated cameras, uh, 10 arrests uh, for petty crimes. Uh, I know of no evidence where uh, these cameras have um, ferreted out terrorists, no evidence where uh, these cameras have really been effective in preventing, deterring, helping with uh, major crimes. And so the question is, how do we spend our money? And I think we can look to Detroit, for example, uh, where after a decade and a half decided to spend their money in other ways. We can look to Oakland that, that studied at great length this issue and the chief of police finally said it's not worth it. We can look to Newark, White Plains, many places throughout the United States. Even Tampa um, has abandoned, the, at least for the moment, the uh, facial recognition program that it had uh, two years ago during the Super Bowl. So these adventures have been tried and abandoned, and we need to know whether they're cost-effective. And particularly when you measure the cost, dollars and cents, uh, not only the cost in terms of dollars and cents, but the cost to our privacy, uh, the, uh, the burdens far outweigh the benefits, in, in our opinion. Uh, I think you raise a good point, and uh, this will be my last statement about about uh, costs. Of course, the cost of stationing a cop uh, is very substantial cost uh, as well, and having him look at everybody who goes up and down <laughs> is the kind of in, quote invasion that I did not have when I walked up the Capitol steps b before. I'm going to ask the chair because I think Mr. Barnes has raised an important question about effectiveness that we have not had answered here. It is true that the chief said that 10 percent of those arrests in, in Sydney, which was a very high number, uh, 10 percent of the arrests came from this camera. And he mentioned things like assaults and, and the rest of it. I would like to ask the chair if we, if we might write to Detroit to the locations that have been named so that we might add to the record why they abandoned this. I mean, the, for all we know, uh, the um, the um, technology might not have been as effective then, uh, but we need to know uh, why it was abandoned because the whole notion of effectiveness seems to me to be at the root of this. If we just put some cameras up there to make ourselves feel good, then it does seem to me we ought to take them down right away. Thank you very much, Ms. Chair. I think that's a good idea, Ms. Norton. We may want to, without overtaxing the GAO, ask them to to look at how effective uh, these surveillance devices are. Um, and I want to thank this, uh, uh, this panel for the, for the expertise you've given us. I know there are a number of other questions we'd like to get to you. As an aside, before I just 
conclude. Mr. Barnes, what's the ACLU's position on the use of red light and speed cameras if they are tied into a camera surveillance system like the districts? Do you have a position on that? Well, um, no, we haven't taken a position, but I will say this, Madam Chair, the difference between the red light cameras is that they focus on a specific individual who allegedly has run a red light in a particular circumstance. That's very different from the general focus on all of us that this mm -hmm. video camera surveillance mm -hmm. system would do. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, we, are, we will be calling on you if we do draft any legislation to give us your expert response and advice as we move along, if that would be acceptable with you. We feel that we, feel that we have some good minds here with um, um, adequate background, experience, and that you could enhance what we, what we may want to do. So I do want to thank you all for being here. I'm going to adjourn this subcommittee. I think it's been an excellent hearing. And I want to recommend uh, accolades for our staffs on the majority side, Russell Smith, the staff director, Rob White, Shelley Kim, uh, Matthew Bott, uh, Hia Vazirani Fails on the minority side, John uh, Boker, uh, Bowker. John, I do that all the time to you. <laughs> John Bowker, uh, Early Green. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Congresswoman. Coming up next on C-SPAN, a Howard University discussion on